If you want to know what a hero's journey looks like in modern day, watch the first three Star Wars. They were specifically written as a hero's journey. And if you want to reach our young people and get them in action, that's the sort of thing we need to write. And my little efforts are just to help start it off. Welcome to Climate Emergency Forum. My name is Regina, and I'll be your host today. And today is our first show of 2024. So whenever you're watching this, Happy New Year to all of you. Today on the show, we have a very special guest, Mr. Tom Riley, who will discuss his new young adult novel, Dark Heat. And in fact, we will be discussing reaching youth through climate fiction. And this is really such an important topic. I know that we uh, bring so many different topics to you. A lot of time we speak to the science of climate change, the disasters that surround us, the kind of sad things that we can look forward to down the line. But one thing that's really, really important, and I just think so incredibly vital and actually largely missing is the arts. I've been wondering for the years, where are the artists and why are they not speaking to the biggest issue of our time? Climate change is no doubt the biggest issue of our time. No one, no living being on this planet, neither tree nor ant nor human will escape the effects of climate change. I remember when I visited Spain a few years ago, I got to see Picasso's Guernica. Now, this painting was tremendously famous. Uh, it shocked it shocked millions and is largely accredited for stopping a war because it was so appallingly shocking. This is what art can do. It can reach down and just grab us by the heart and make us see something in a way that we've never seen before. And what is more important than writing a book that can reach the youth of this world to help change their perspective, bring them to an understanding of what's happening, allow them to enter the reality of climate change in a way that doesn't make them shut down, but actually brings them into the conversation of climate change so that they can begin to speak to each other, bring solace to each other, and maybe find ways to deal with this and perhaps even educate some of the older people in the world who seem just fine with the status quo. And I'm gonna go ahead and, and turn it over to our author. And Tom Riley retired from NASA in 2014 and he started coaching young people in STEM field. Of course, you know that stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. It became clear to him after working with these young people that he needed to develop a detailed discussion of what they needed to do about the climate crisis and how it will affect their future. The series of fiction books is his efforts to explain what they needed to do and how to go about doing it. And you can order the, his books from Amazon or directly from the publisher at booksidepress.com. And of course, we will provide those links for you. And we encourage you to check out his work. Hear, hear, author, please tell us about your book that has just come off the presses. Thank you. The book is called Dark Heat, and it is the third in a series of novels uh, about a young African-American woman named Sarah, with an H, and her AI partner, who are trying to learn to be detectives. And to achieve that, they go out looking for the spoilers and the thieves who are messing up 
real efforts to address our climate crisis. The story is set about 13 years in the future where the climate crisis is hit and hit hard. And it provides a image of believable characters in action to affect change. The intention is to tell our young people enough about what they would expect, they can expect, so that they get into action and are not scared out of action. Most of the climate crisis uh, books today have been gloom and doom stuff, and that'll get people into action, scare them into action for a short time, but they very soon burn out. If you want people in action for a long time, show them some characters they can identify with in effective actions that are doing something, even if the times are hard and in general, they're getting hit about the head and shoulders. The style of the three novels is called film noir, which was a simply a French term for black film, meaning dark. You got a, a investigator of some sort. He has some kind of relationship with the police, she in this case, and they then are working out the problem of uh, some great thievery or something. And a great many of the films are shot in, at night, uh, the scenes. This is, was very popular in the 40s and 50s. I don't know how popular it's going to be with our young people, but we're going to give it a try. One key element is that one of the key, uh, main characters is an artificial intelligence. She is not a robot, per se, because she only appears on screens because the character that was robotic would have an enormous carbon footprint, whereas a character who appears on screens, even quite, quite intelligent, has a very low carbon footprint. Uh, this seemed to be much a much better solution. Any story set in the near future is going to have to address artificial intelligence some way or another. In this series, the big AIs are legally associated with a specific human being who is responsible for them. They then serve as a pair. AIs make much better team members than they do slave masters. That's not understood well. In Dark Heat, the particular villain has stolen a grain shipment headed for overseas that would have saved the lives of hundreds, if not thousands of people, and did so simply to earn money for himself, very selfish. So that is the type of villain that fits right into the film noir concept and is believable in this situation. Yes, there are people who would rob the poor and watch them die, and we can't let that happen without objection. Anyway, the three, all three books are, the first book called Born to Storms is a young adult coming of age story, and the second two are both uh, film noir detective stories. The key thing is, all right, if you look at what we need to do, we need to establish a new society over the next couple hundred years that is the Society for Sustainable Earth. How do you establish a society? One of the building blocks you must have is stories, whether it's the Euclid, the story of Troy, or whether it's uh, Genesis. You have to have very important stories that people can tell each other that mean they're all part of the same society. Consequently, our poor efforts here are just to start we need young people who can write better than us to write the story. Uh, if you want to look at the death behind it, uh, the, a very beloved archaeologist named Joseph Campbell wrote about myths, and his primary work is called The Hero's Journey. If you want to know what a hero's journey looks like in modern day, Watch the first three Star Wars. They were specifically written as a hero's journey. And if you want to reach 
our young people and get them in action, that's the sort of thing we need to write. And my little efforts are just to help start it off. I don't claim to be, you know, John Steinbeck here. I'm just trying to say, here's what we need to do. Here's a way to do it. It's not the only thing we need to do, but one of the things we need to do is write the stories that are the foundation for our new sustainable earth. Thank you so much, Tom, for that introduction to your novel. It sounds really, really great. By the way, I'm a huge fan of film noir. Uh, I just recently saw The Third Man for the first time. What a wonderful film. I'm also a big fan of John Steinbeck. Um, so thank you so much for sharing your very inspirational motivation for writing this book. And I know that you've spoken um, with Paul and that y'all have talked about this book as well. Paul, will you share some of your insights and thoughts about this novel? Thank you, R Regina. And um, I love your reference to Picasso's painting in Spain. I know I probably saw that painting in the museum when you saw it, but I had no idea about the historical implications, as you mentioned, to, to stop a war. I think, you know, art is extremely popular. It reminds me of World War II when there were cuts to increase the military spending. There were cuts to arts and so on. And Churchill, Winston Churchill vetoed those. He said, without the arts, what's the point of even fighting the war for freedom, right? People, arts are crucial for, for people and for societies. So art is vital for maintaining morale within society, for giving societies collective direction, et cetera. So I have to ask Tom, you've been doing, you know, lots of work with the young people with STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, and you have an engineering background from your NASA work. What made you actually think that approaching young people with fiction would be one of the best ways to, to communicate the climate crisis to, to young people. When I first retired from NASA, I was tutoring young people in STEM, science, technology, and engineering, in a little kind of grassroots space program called the Big Moon Dig, about digging into the surface of the moon to get the protection you need and how that would work and what that would look like and what are the problems and technical stuff. It came very, uh, after a year or two, it became clear that, yes, space can make a number of important contributions to our climate crisis, the biggest of which is simply a vision of the future. And that is the big thing space does. It also has communication satellites and Earth me measuring satellites, which is what I worked on when I was at NASA. But the big thing is it gives you an image of the future, a positive image, an image of adventure. But we have to address our climate crisis before we go back to the moon. Yes. I mean, we're living in very strange times because surveys of the general population of all different demographics and ages show that it's actually the, the young people in the past, in any of these surveys, the, the most optimistic responses on these surveys were from young people. But that switched. Now, a lot of these surveys show that young people have a very pessimistic and dire view of the future, largely because of climate change, but also because of ongoing wars, because of the political leadership that they see is not catering to them at all because of the inflation, because of their lack of ability to, to even consider buying houses. You know, many young people have given up on the idea of houses. Also, uh, many young women have given up on the idea of even having children because they wonder what type of world they'll be bringing, raising these children into. So I think the, you know, the arts, including things like your, your book, are very important to, to give, you know, to open the eyes of young people to say, you know, another world is possible. And I like how your book is relying just on, you know, it's fiction, it's a story, but it's completely woven around a very realistic future ravaged by climate change. You talk about droughts, you talk about wet bulb temperature, you talk about food shortages, you know, you hit all of the key elements 
And I can tell that you've been, <laughs> you know, watching, as you've mentioned, uh, my, uh, my YouTube channel, but also other ones like Climate Emergency Forum that are painting, that are, that are really informing people. So, you know, I, I really want to thank you for that sort of thing. Uh, let me ask you about artificial intelligence, because you mentioned the, the increasing role of artificial intelligence. And in fact, the World Economic Forum just did a survey of the top 10 dangers facing humanity in the next two years versus in the next 10 years. And cyber crime, uh, cyber attacks, artificial intelligence going rogue is a big part of that. So you, you're, you're talking about artificial intelligence as team members teaming up with humans. And I love that in, in your book because Sarah's the young woman, her best friend is um, Janet N, who, who's an artificial intelligence. So can you talk a bit more about AI being team members versus slave members? Because the WEF, the World Economic Forum report, one of the big concerns about AI was all the false information that can be sent worldwide, the, the misinformation, the lies, being enabled to get reach a lot of people because of AI technologies. So there's always double-edged swords to technology. So maybe just talk a little bit more about how you used AI in your book, because you actually used it to even write some parts of your book, which then you heavily edited as an author. So can you talk a little bit more about that? Yes, as we started, uh dark heat and the name was chosen or, or presented by an ai you never ask the ai what's the best thing you always ask the ai give me five good ones and then you choose from the five and if they don't like those five give me 10 more the key is that ai is coming on very fast and it will disrupt, it is a society disruptor. Good, bad, and indifferent, it's gonna disrupt. If we have a built-in disruptor, then we'd better get ready and have an idea of what the society needs to be, and that society we know needs to be a, for a sustainable Earth. So because there's a big, big disruptor that's going to kick society in the teeth, this is both a problem and an opportunity to, in fact, rebuild a society along sustainable lines, which might not have been available had the society not got the kick in the teeth. And there are a number of ways that do it uh, that could AI could be handled by people, and it would be really good to have a whole bunch of different stories about different ways it was handled. And that would really help. Thank you so much, Tom. I have a question. Um, so I'm interested in that you placed a big climate disruption in your book in Southeast Asia. And I was wondering why you picked that particular region for this tumult to happen? There are maps available on the internet that show the pl the places that are in trouble as over the next few decades. One of the most important places for heat is India and Southeast Asia. Consequently, uh, and there we don't really have the type of infrastructure, for example, in the United States, we will have community centers and so forth that are air conditioned and have backups and so forth that that people who are desperate can go and sit and read a book. You're not going to have that in Southeast Asia. You're going to have large numbers of people who must make their living out in the fields, pulling your rickshaws, all this type of manual work, and living in a tight area that really picks up heat like these slum areas picks up heat like an oven from the construction materials they use consequently we're only saying we're 13 years in the future therefore we need stuff that is coming on fairly fast most of the big problems are coming on really slow we spend a lot of time working on what to do with the oceans and the tidal rise rise in sea level, but that's going to work out over hundreds of years. 
And in 13 years, it will be detectable and scary, and it will grossly wipe out insurance rates and stuff like that, but it's not really at the great disruption yet. Whereas the AI, a dis disruption, probably this year, if not this year, next. And my major concern is AIs displacing people's work. And if you take people out of work, then you really are kicking society in the teeth. And we don't know how to do that. And that's one of the big things we need to show in all these stories is what kind of work people are doing with respect to AIs. But having an AI as your team member is much more likely to keep you working than fighting against it. We ain't pushing this tide back. I, I really like how you speak to AI and the importance and of AI and how it will affect will affect humans. And Paul, when you were speaking to young people and their despair, which I completely understand, you know, I think I, AI is also a factor in that. There's some things that, you know, even as a hobbyist photographer, I used to shoot photography a lot on film. And when digital cameras came out, the fun ended for me. And so that wonderful pastime that gave my life so much meaning, my father was a photographer. I used to develop my own film, work in the dark room, and that joy is gone. I really do believe that technology has a capacity to give and also to take away. But what I really liked, Tom, when you speak to AI was the main character, you manifested her in a way that um, at the AI person, you, you manifested her as a person. And these two uh, young women are working together as a team, as you say, and not fighting against each other. And I, I really thought that was a clever way of addressing how to handle AI. And I was wondering if there was intentionality in that when you created the AI character and the two, the team that the lead team in your book? Yes, of course, it was very intentional, but it was done four years ago. And that was a lot, you know, AI was much farther back then. And I was surprised at how well it worked once ChatGBT came out and AI got heavy. The key here is that if you want to be working, you know, in 10 years, there will be people who are teamed with AI and people who are out of work. And you want to be teamed with AI. And this was just one possibility of how that might be handled. I want to see stories of a dozen more ways that it might be handled so that everybody gets a, gets a working idea. In a high technology world, there's always disruptions to the society that come periodically, and they can either be a kick in the teeth or they can be a kick in the seat of the pants to get moving. And so we're trying to, how we're going to make the AI a kick in the seat of our pants to move toward a sustainable earth. That, that's great. Thanks so much, Tom. I just want to chime in a little bit myself because I play a lot of chess and I follow chess at world level. It turns out that um, we know that chess programs now are much stronger than the, the, the strongest human by a wide margin, such that it, it almost doesn't make sense for, you know, humans like playing each other as opposed to playing the machine. But what's interesting is that when you have these hybrid chess tournaments where you have humans playing each other and humans can have AIs to assist them, it's interesting that the net result is a much stronger player. Like humans paired with AIs are much, much stronger than the AIs alone or, the, or than the humans alone. It's, it's quite interesting. I think that applies to probably to competitions at, at many different levels, right? So, I, I mean, we're only scratching the surface with AI, I think. You know, uh, the biggest concern of the, the World Economic Forum was that AIs would be used to create false propaganda on climate and other aspects of society and cause this polarization of people even more so than we've seen in the last, say, half a decade to a, to a decade. You know, elections being stolen, loss of democracy, you know, so there's always positives and negatives with any technology. And, you know, we're still struggling with finding more of the positives and have them overweigh the negatives of AI technology. So, I mean, what I, another thing I really liked about your book was that it raises questions which I've never thought of before. I've never seen even discussed before. And I'll talk about 
the idea of, um, you know, when you get AI good enough and you get a persona, what happens when it's obsolete by better AIs? Like, do you just unplug it like a toaster? You know, you could argue that it's an entity in itself and it would be unethical to do that. So you talk about having like a repository for older AIs that then can be used in other parts of the world by other people. I really like some of the philosophical questions that your book raises and, you know, things that I've never thought of before. So thank you for that. That's one of the hard parts. What do you do with old AIs? Do you have an ethics that says keep them alive some way? Do you have a ethical requirement to upgrade them to improve their security and improve their uh, capabilities? There'll be people who want to do that and there'll be some money for that. But there'll also be people, as shown in the book, who are out to kill all, all AIs they can reach. Consequently, it sets up a arms race of security for the AIs versus a, a tax. And of course, because it's a book, you need some drama. This is one of the big dramas in the book is between these two groups. And Paul, I hope that you served as a consultant to this novel. Would you share us a little bit about that experience and how that came about? Yeah, I want to uh, thank Tom for, first of all, watching many of my videos over the past number of years on our, our climate crisis. That's how he, how he found out about me. And uh, also thank him for contacting me and asking him to read his uh, drafts of his uh, latest book and do some editing and also examine the, the, the future, you know, 10, 15 years in the future that he depicts uh, for accuracy. Because although, you know, it's climate fiction, it's a story, it's woven around a world that I think is very realistic. He's portrayed it very realistically in his book. And I think this is useful for, for young people understanding some of the things that we can expect in the near term future, say in the next five, 10, 15 years. So, so I want to thank Tom for reaching out and for contacting me. And it's been a pleasure uh, working with him on his uh, latest book, Dark Heat. So um, Tom, I'm just wondering, I know that like you've worked with youth um, you obviously care. You care about the future of humanity and the planet. If you had advice to offer them, you know, from you, what would it be? What would you say to them about the future? Don't get sucked in by doom and gloom stuff. Let's get some ideas going. Let's get some stories going. Let's get some big adventures going and get people in action. Well, thank you so much, Tom. That That's great advice, not just for young people, but for young and old alike. Definitely, you know, doom and gloom, it has its place, but it tends to like innervate. It brings people's energy down. Whereas if we're able to face the issue at hand and not get bogged down by the negativity, the human being can do amazing things. So I really appreciate your sharing that advice. And I absolutely appreciate you're doing what so many other creative people need to do, which is create stories, whether it's music, fiction, nonfiction, art, visual arts, music about climate change. Come on, people. This is where it's at. This is the big issue. Thank you. Thank you for the work that you've done, Tom. We really appreciate having you on the show. And those of you who have joined us, we appreciate you out there. Make 2024 a banner year for us. And if you haven't subscribed, go ahead and do it while I wait. And if you learned something from this video, share it. Go ahead and like it. And if you have any comments for Tom or any thoughts about uh, this amazing book that he's written, please leave them in the uh, comment section. We'd love to hear what you have to say. And we'll see you next time at the Climate Emergency Forum. 